Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we lost all the young becoming scientists here, I can see. <laughs> all of them left. <coughs> uh, yes, I'm going to talk from a different perspective because I'm a cardiovascular physiologist. So I work with anything that have a heart. I've been working with spiders, giraffes, rabbits, uh, fish, crocodiles, pythons. And in, I'm bi bipolar, but not in a medical sense, but I work in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. I've been eight times to the Antarctica and three times to the Arctic. And uh, my original um, interest is, of course, how do a fish that live with a body temperature of minus 1.86 working. Uh, I've been, I've, I started my PhD uh, looking at the cardiovascular system and its regulation. And For those of you who don't know, the, uh, our body works on a dual pump, left and right side. A fish have one heart, one ventricle that pumps the blood through the gills, and there it's oxygenated, and then the blood goes to the body where it's deoxygenated, goes back to the heart. It's a very fascinating system because they actually pump the blood to two f through two um, capillary system, high resistance systems. So the heart, our our system here only pumps uh, at, through one capillary system, either through the lungs or through the body. The fish have to, uh, to manage to pump through the gills, and then whatever left in pressure here has to drive the uh, blood through the body here. So the fish heart is different. Uh, going through this to the cellular level, it, the fish heart is the same. I mean, looking at the muscular cell structure, it's the same. But the, the anat anatomy is different. So the human circulation, one capillary bed per side, operates at 37 degree mostly. We have a hematocrit, which I'll come back to later on, which is around 45. Fish circulation, uh, two capillary beds in series. It operates from anything from minus 1.86, which is the freezing point of water, up to 43. Not in a single individual, but there are species living at, at these temperatures. And they have a hematocrit of 0 to 45%, which is also very interesting. This is a very slowly beating heart. It picks up here you now and the computer picks up. So this is how a, a fish heart looks like. This is the atrium, this is the ventricle, and this is the start of the ventral aorta. So this is a heart in a, in a chamber. So you can keep the heart isolated and you can study, study it uh, much easier than you can study a human heart because this heart will keep, keep beating. The human heart that you take out the body will stop beating and go into cardiac arrest very quickly. So, this you have seen, many people have sort of plowed the ground for my talk here, talking about things that I don't know much about. Uh, I know I've been working there on Greenland and here and there in um, Antarctica. The, the big difference is, of course, as, as we heard, that there is no real barrier here. Fish can actually swim from the Swedish west coast all the way up here and explore and swims back. The Antarctic is surrounded by the polar front, which is a barrier, and the fish that are trapped inside there can't escape, and there, is in, there seems to be no fish going into the area. So here they have been genetically isolated for a long, long period. Both these areas have extremely cold water, at least during the winter time, while the uh, Antarctic have a cold um, water temperature in some areas all the year round. So this is just a um, temperature, um, temperature profile. You can see here, we have seen that before, seawater temperature in the McMurdo area, uh, in some other areas. In the McMurdo area down here, it's extremely stable around the freezing point of water. And that's where I went first for in my exploration of these fish, because if you have a heart that sits on the freezing point of water, how does it operate? What, how does it, is it regulated? Uh, then later on, we have exp uh, expanded the studies to the Arctic, and, and also last time we went to the Palmer Station up here. So basically, it's the cold temperature here that attracted me first, because that was my interest. How does it work? I will come to talk a little bit about 
what is now the focus of the research, and that is how the climate change will affect these fish. So, first, a little bit of 101 basic physiology. Um, we have a lot of fish species. They are ectotherms. That means that they have the same temperature as the surrounding water. Some of them are, uh, have body parts that can be kept at different temperature. But in general, fish have a body temperature that is the same as the water temperature. And it goes from one minus 1.9 up to 43 uh, degrees. Freezing point of fluid. Our fingers freeze at minus one, roughly. So if you keep your fingers too long in the minus one degree water, it will get stiff and dead. Uh, fish body also freeze at around minus one. But the water temperature is minus 1.86. So clearly, uh, these fish would be either stiff and dead, and they are not. So they have strategies to avoid this. You can do it by su supercooling, so you can allow your your body fluids to supercool. Uh, and that means that they are below the freezing point. It's a very dangerous life, because if you come in contact with the ice crystal or something, you can instantly freeze your entire body. You can do the trick if you take a bottle of, of um, sparkling water and put outside. And then you can take it in, open it, and it will freeze instan instantaneously if you keep it at, at low temperature. You can elevate your osmotic pressure. Basically, you can increase your salt concentration in the body. That will lower your freezing point, uh, because water freezes at minus 1.86. So if you could uh, increase the salt concentration to that level, you would stay unfrozen. Or you could produce antifreeze. And there are two different types um, of antifreezes. And uh, as we heard earlier here, the uh, Antarctic fish, they produce antifreeze uh, glycoproteins, and the Arctic, in many cases, uh, produce antifreeze proteins. What is the consequences? Oh, sorry. Uh, so you can see here a little map of um, species that produce uh, antifreeze glycoproteins, or antifreeze proteins in different uh, uh, species here. So it's both in the north and in the south, because even in the north during the winter time, the water gets below the freezing point of the body temperature. So they need to if they're going to stay in that area. The problem for the fish is that this affects the viscosity. Producing antifreeze uh, proteins affects the viscosity of the, the blood. And the viscosity of a fluid is affected by the temperature. So when you cool down something, the viscosity goes up. A couple of thousand people every year in England dies from viscosity problem. Because when you get cold hand and feet, the viscosity of your fluid, the, the blood, goes up, and that can overpower the heart. So if you have a, a cardiac problem, you should try to avoid cold hands and feet. These fish have a body temperature of minus 1.6, or minus 1.8, let's make it easier. That means that they already live with a blood that is very viscous compared to um, tropical fish. And the heart has to pump this vis viscous blood. On top of that, they add antifreeze proteins to keep them from freezing, and that adds to the viscosity. So if you look at Antarctic species, they have a hematocrit, sorry, relative viscosity of the blood and hematocrit, the red line. We are sitting around here, 45%. That means that our blood is three times as viscous as water. And if you increase your hematocrit, viscosity goes up. This is the problem with blood doping because the heart can get overloaded. Antarctic species are found in this area, so from 35 maybe down to zero. Temperate fish species are found in this area, from maybe 25 up to 45, 50. We need hematocrit because the red blood cells that makes up hematocrit contains hemoglobin. Hemoglobin transports oxygen. 
So we need it. At the same time, it affects the viscosity of the blood. And the an Arctic fish and the Antarctic fish living at a very low temperature have the added problem of the temperature of the um, surrounding that affects the viscosity and the effects of antifreeze proteins, glycoproteins or, or proteins that also affect them. So they have an added problem with the transport of oxygen. So temperature affects the um, viscosity, antifreeze proteins, the hematocrit in itself, and also red cell deformability. Our blood cells are actually squeezed through the capillary beds, uh, and they have to deform to go through. And the deformability affects the viscosity of the blood, or, or the power, or power that is needed. So, what do uh, Arctic fish do? This is a very old study that we did. It was a mistake, as many scientific experiments are. We looked at cardiovascular regulation, and there you use a substance called atropine. Uh, it blocks a certain receptor in the body. Um, and when we dissected the fish, we noted that the spleen was extremely big in the fish that had been treated with this uh, substance. So the next time we came down to Antarctica, we set up another experiment where we took a blood sample from our fish, we stressed it, took another blood sample, measured the hematocrit. So in the resting fish, the hematocrit was around 17%. In the stressed fish, it was 34 so double. Then we gave them atropine, and then we stressed them, and they reached maximum of 7. They had an enormous spleen. All the red blood cells were stored in the spleen. This is the world champion in blood doping, and they do it legally, because they do it through the spleen. So when they don't need the oxygen transport capacity, they lower the hematocrit, thus lower the viscosity of the blood. When they are stressed or they swim to catch something, they compress the, the spleen and increase the oxygen transport uh, capacity tremendously. So they blood dope themselves. And this is probably, um, if you look at the Antarctic species, this is the hematocrit change capacity compared to species that live at warmer temperature. So it seems that species that live in the Arctic and are challenged by the very temperature and antifreeze protein topping up the viscosity, they have a higher capacity to store the red blood cells in the spleen and dump them into the circulation when needed. And when they don't need it, it's stored back in the spleen because then they save the heart. Does it have any effect? Yes, this is oxygen transport and this is hematocrit. So if you take animals where you took out the spleen, the blue ones, and animals where you maintain the spleen in the body, you can see that the animals with the spleen intact have a higher maximum uh, oxygen transport capacity. Not very strange just shown here in the graph. And it also affects the blood pressure, because in the control where they are allowed to increase the hematocrit, blood pressure is higher. And blood pressure is generated by the heart to overcome the resistance. So there is a consequence of having a lot of hematocrit in your blood, because your blood pressure, your heart needs to pump harder. So, this was the first part of my talk, and this all had to do with what these fish have to do to overcome that they're actually living in an in environment that is cold. The next part here will talk more about how these fish cope with it and how they can possibly cope with the challenges we have. Here is um, Rockström's 19, oh, 2009 paper, uh, where he pointed out what, we are, what the globe is facing. And climate change is a red zone. Um, so we heard that the, we have an Arctic amplification here. We've seen, maybe not this diagram, but we see the carbon dioxide rising. We see the global temperature rising. We're living in a world where we have an increase in temperature due to our impact. We are flying around the world to talk about global changes, 
and we add to the global changes. Isn't that beautiful? We keep our own job. This is a paper by uh, uh, Arrhenius, a Swedish scientist, 1896. Another side of the question that has long attracted the attention of physicists is this. Is the, is the mean temperature of the ground in any way influenced by the presence of heat-absorbing gas in the atmosphere? This was 1896. And they had discussed this for a long time. I never heard about global warming due to carbon dioxide when I went through my basic biology in 19... 81 and forward. We forgot all about it, but these guys, they actually thought about it. This is from a paper by Krog, August Krog, a Danish scientist that got a Nobel Prize in 1920. Before leaving this subject, it will be necessary to add some words concerning the influence of the climate on the state of equilibrium and also the possible interaction between the atmospheric carbon dioxide and climate. Again, they looked at it, they talked about it, and then we forgot about it, and then we reinvented this discussion. Oh, this was in 1904, so we invented it maybe eight years later or something. And now we're there. We've seen this Arctic amplification, temperature is going up, uh, general 0 0.6, 0 0.7, three, four, five times faster in the Arctic and also in the West Antarctic. Not the East Antarctic, but in the West Antarctic. There is temperature also going up. And this is just sea ice snow cover and sea ice extent. And we heard about this, how this will affect the albedo. That is how it will affect the absorption of the sun rays. So, when I studied this, uh, we talked about generalists and specialists. Uh, this comes from a paper by Huey and Hurst in 1984, so just when I started my PhDs. Um, specialists are very good at a particular thing, and they are lousy at doing other stuff. And generalists can do money, many things. And when we put the temperature on the x-axis here, and we put some sort of physiological variable there, a specialist is not is good, the physiological variables here, whatever it can be, works at a very optimum, and it's a narrow temperature zone. While the generalist may not reach the same height or speed or whatever we were measuring here, but it has a broader temperature zone. And it was generally thought that Antarctic fish and Arctic fish must be specialists because they live in a fairly constant temperature year-round, especially the Antarctic fish. They have to be specialists. The problem is, are they? Another paper by a colleague of mine in 2009 uh, talked about aerobic scope. Aerobic scope is good. We all need it. We are sitting down here consuming 250 milliliters of oxygen per minute per person. When you stand up, it increases. When you walk up the stairs, it increases. If you didn't have a scope, you wouldn't be able to walk up the stairs. You need scope for daily life. And the concept here is that as temperature goes up in an ectoterm, the metabolic rate goes up. And then if you somehow test the maximum metabolic rate, the green line here, you will get the green line. So at each temperature here, you, you have a resting metabolic rate, and then you test the maximum. The difference is scope, the black line. And it's thought to be that over a temperature here, um, as temperature goes up, you will fall down a slippery slope here because it basically is too warm. You can't operate at that temperature. You have an optimal temperature here. Problem with the Arctic animals is that Temperature can't really go down. We are at the edge. Minus 1.8, they live there. They only have one way to go, and that's upwards. Oops, sorry. Because below that point, the entire sea is frozen. So the only thing they can do is to go up, and 
people have claimed that they, they live at the optimum. So they must be very, very vulnerable to changes because they are already al almost on a slippery slope downhill. And that's, of course, interesting and scary. So it needs to be tested. If you increase temperature, the rate of a physiological process goes up. This is the acute thing. You increase the rate of a physiological process from this point to this point. And then what happens over time? Over time, in many cases, this happens. You get a compensation. So you increase the temperature, something increases, and then you wait, and then after a while you see a decrease again. If you look at, for instance, swimming performance, uh, burst swimming, you can see that the blue fish species here are Antarctic fish species. This one is a generalist. It, it's the um, Marxus cephalus scorpius, the um, short on scalping. You can see that the Pagotinia broschkevinki living at um, minus one, or tested, I should say, but at minus one, because it actually lives at a little bit a low temperature. It can do as good as, as uh, short on scalping. If you take the short on scalping to minus one, it will do nothing. It will be solidly frozen. So there you have your compensation. By living in the climate, these animals have compensated for the environment. So they can actually do things that other fish species can't do. The question is, can they, how much scope do they have to change? So, uh, we have two different groups of fish down in the Antarctic. We have the white-blooded species, ice fish group that we heard of earlier, hematocrit, zero, or maybe 1% in some, and the 1% is usually just white cells. And then you have the red blood yield, and I show you the graph on these autologous blood transfusion that they have. So, and here you have a heart from an ice fish. Here you have a heart from a red-blooded fish. This is pink, this is white, because not only do they lack uh, he hematocrit, uh, hemoglobin, they also lack myoglobin, the, the pigment that colors our cells or, or muscles red. Things doesn't stop here because it gets more complicated. These are two of the ice fish um, uh, species. One is pinker than the other because the ice fish group, some of them lack hemoglobin but have myoglobin. Some of them lack myoglobin and hemoglobin. So within this group, uh, the story gets even more complicated. So this is just a heart from a uh, ice fish that lacks both the uh, hemoglobin and myoglobin, and this is from a rhastospinosus that have lack hemoglobin but have myoglobin. But m there some of the pictures coming here will focus mo mostly on, on uh, Arctic species here, Antarctic species uh, and their regulation, um, spe specifically the Pagotenia borskevinki and the Trematomus benaki. How do we do this research? It's fun. Uh, it's um, a strange environment, very beautiful environment. We, I have been flying, I had the fortune to work with Bill Davison at, at New Zealand, in New Zealand, and we've been flying down from Christchurch, landing on the ice, going either to McMoto Station, uh, I've been there once, or to Scott Base. I've been there uh, many times. They are side by side. I think it's three kilometers between them. Um, we have to fish. You go out over the ice and you find a spot that is good and you hope to get fish because there is no supplier there. It's a very beautiful fishing spot. One of the probably best fishing spots in the world. Uh, very, very nice. If you're lucky, the ice is only two meter thick. If you're unlucky, it's four, five meter thick. Um, and then you drill deeper. You 
have to carry all the equipment down. Uh, we are measuring blood flow, blood pressure, ECG, and, and uh, this, this stuff. So we need to carry all the equipment, and we get a tiny lab space. So it looks like crap in the lab, uh, because we have very little space. And this is just an uh, operating, operating, operating table for fish. So a microscope and operating table where you can instrument the fish. This is Jenny Thurusson. She was one of the PhD students on, on one of the trip. So what did we find? Together with lots and lots of other scientists, I have not done this myself, of course. There is lots of people going down there. So looking at heartbeats per minute, frogs and rats on this side, tuners on this side. So you see a tuna is around 100, 120. Blue is Antarctic fish, red is uh, Arctic fish, they have a lower heart rate. But if you, sorry, if you took any of these species and lowered the temperature to minus 1.8, their heart would stop. So they, they, they have a low heart rate, but they have compensated for the low temperature. This is a little bit complicated, but I'm going to just go through, through it quickly. This is blood pressure uh, and stroke volume, and again, stroke volume here, and you c we, can, we can look at this part, which is cleaner. So you see the stroke volume, that is the amount of blood pumped from the heart in each stroke. Tuna fish have, have a fairly good stroke volume, then most of the other fish have fairly low stroke volume. And then at this end, we have the ice fish, they don't have any hemoglobin. They, don't, they lack transport protein for oxygen. And they have enormous stroke volumes. They compensated for the lack of hemoglobin by pumping large volume of blood. Capacity of the heart. Our heart, you and me, generate 2.5 millivolt per gram ventricle tissue. So if you took the heart out and, and could quantify the power of our cardiac muscle, it would be around 2.5 milliwatts per gram tissue. Look at this fish here, Pagotenia boschewinki. Antarctic fish tested at zero degree, 2.3. Look at the tuna, 7.6, 7 and then you have uh, the lowest uh, in, in the fish, it's a hagfish heart. But if you compare the our heart with the, with the um, Antarctic fish, it's very much the same. So again, they have compensated because our heart would not generate anything at zero degree. Absolutely nothing. I'm going to switch to Greenland because we went there three times to have a look and we worked from a beautiful spot here on... on um, the island, it's a Danish research station, extremely beautiful surrounding, completely different to Antarctica. This is in August. So, um, different fishing, uh, we go in, by in, a, in a boat. Life jackets was, they didn't know what that was, so we never got any life jackets. We got a rifle though. <laughs> I don't know if we were supposed to shoot each other if we fell into the water, because it was zero degree basically, but no, life jackets, no. Um, again, extremely beautiful in a different way. And of course, a different uh, fishing. Here we, we didn't have to drill anything, we just fished with rods. We worked with uh, three different scalpins. Two of the scalpins, Triscuspis and Scorpioides, are Arctic scalpins. They're, they only exist up in the Arctic. This one, the uh, shorthorn scalpin, you can find it from Portugal all the way up to Greenland. So it's sort of a widespread species. And we wanted to test and see. They live at the same place. We fished them from the same place in Greenland. And we wanted to test to see how do they do in temperature change. So we tested them at 1, 4, 7, and 10. This is cardiac output, so this is how much her heart can pump, and it's a good estimate on how the oxygen transport system works, because you need the heart to transport oxygen. And you can see that the Arctic, two Arctic species, green and red, they increase from one to four, but then they sort of crash. 
they don't continue to increase. While the Scorpius here just keep going. The warmer, the better. And we did a lot of other different studies in this species um, showing, um, measuring scope here, and again, um, these three uh, species. And we showed that if the temperature along the Greenland coast increases, the only species that will thrive is the short on scalping. The other two species will either have to travel north to look for colder water or be outcompeted by the species from that live from Portugal and up to the uh, Arctic. So this is where we started to look at more on the effects of global temperature changes. We did a lot of other studies in these species and it came out every time that the uh, omni, oh, the species that live from Portugal up to Arctic have an advantage when the temperature goes up. The Arctic species do uh, worse. And the last part here is a recent trip I did to Palmer Station at a completely different part of Antarctica. You had to embark on this huge ship. You had to spend four days. Uh, you had to pass Drake Sound. I don't know how many of you have done that, but it's an interesting when it, uh, the waves come and, and, and hit you. Um, you hit Palmer Station on a foggy day, and then you stay there and you do your research there. And this time we were after these ones, the ice fish, because they have been claimed to be extremely vulnerable for climate change because they lack hemoglobin, and some of them lack myoglobin. Um, so we wanted to know, because the, the literature said that they had a, a cardiac output of 105 milliliters per minute, compared to the red-blooded species that had an average of 19. This is the resistance of the vasculature, so we can ignore that. But you can see that the huge difference, and this was explained that, of course, if you don't have red blood cells, if you don't have any transport capacity, you have to increase the turnover. So your heart has to pump enormous amount of, of plasma instead to supply the tissue. But we, we doubted this because this is really, really high values. So we wanted to repeat it. And we had, compared to these studies, we had a little bit of new technique with us that allowed us to do different kinds of measurements. So, we worked on, on the Acerato. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to present a, a short, short uh, description of the Aceratus, the, uh, the ice fish here. Um, if, oops, sorry. If you look at the cardiac output we got, it was not 105, it was 26. Instead, compared to 19 for the other red-blooded ones. Maximum 52, so not even close. We did have species that went higher, but this is the average. So, if you look, if you put this in a table now, you see that the ice fish here comes to 26, the Trematomus bernacki, 17, Pagotenia borskovinki, 29, so even higher than the ice fish, and Coriceps, Nototina Coriceps at 6.5. There is a variation, but we could not find the extremely high um, cardiac output that we was found earlier. And that's probably because people worked on stressed animals. If we measured cardiac output in you when you were spinning on a, on, in a gym, you had a high, you have a high cardiac output, but because, that's you, because you're stressed, your body reacts to it. And that's the same with these species here. And then we measured a ton of different variables, you can see, Heart rates here at 11, uh, and uh, blood pressure, and so on, and so on. This I'm not going to go through, because then you're going to definitely fall asleep. But I just show you that we measured a number, cardiac output, uh, heart rate, stroke volume, uh, pressure uh, in the ventral aorta, pressure in the dorsal aorta, central venous pressure, which is very interesting if you have a couple of hours, uh, oxygen tension, Oh, no, sorry, oxygen consumption here, 
and systemic uh, and uh, branchial resistance. So we did a, a quite thorough study and, and tried once and for all to figure out how these animals work. We also did some pharmacology. Uh, this, is, this is not pharmacology, this is just stress. Uh, so you can see that the cardiac output here goes up when you stress these animals, heart rate goes up, exactly what you find in, in other species. Pharmacolo uh, pharmacology, adenosine, uh, shows that they have a nice vasodilation to adenosine. That was also said to not to be true, and that's again probably because uh, in the earlier studies they worked with stressed animals. You can also see that they react, the heart rate reacts nicely to it, uh, and it's a barostatic reflex, so they have a, a nice barostatic reflex, which is nerdy, but it's nice for us. So, uh, conclusion here. Hematocrit lower in the red-blooded species with a large capacity for autologous blood doping, blood doping and absent in the ice fish group. The interesting thing is that the ice fish group retains the capacity to spleen contraction. So probably before they lost the hematocrit, they had the capacity to increase the hematocrit by spleen contraction. Now they can just contract the spleen, but it doesn't do anything because it doesn't contain any red blood cells but they have retained it. The control of the heart and vasculature is not substantially different from what we see in other species. Um, the ice fish group do not have the extreme high cardiac output that was indicated in earlier studies. Polar fish species are capable of acclimation to higher temperature. I haven't talked about that, but if you do careful experiments, uh, you can acclimate them. If, I, if you take an uh, Antarctic fish from minus 1.8 and put it in a 4 degree aquarium, it flips over and dies. But if you increase the temperature slowly over a couple of weeks, you can actually have them swimming at 10. Nothing is known about the adaptive capacity. We don't know what the generation effect is. And lastly, and I, that's why I hope that the new scientist generation would have stayed, we need to do more clever experiments if we want to know what will happen in the future. Because most of the experiments we've done so far is crap. We have tried to simulate what happens in 100 years' time with global warming. So we have gone into the lab, we took a fish there, we dumped it in warm water, said, oh, it's not go doing good. Sure, it's not doing good. If they transfer you to a 110 degree sauna, you can sit there for a time and then you, you just keel over. So we have done quite crappy experiments. In many cases, because as we heard earlier here, the time frame for doing these experiments are short. You're going on a ship, you're going on a cruise, you have a couple of weeks. We don't have the luxury of keeping these animals in a controlled lab environment where we can actually study them over long periods of time, over generations. So I think that there is... I don't, I don't say that we shouldn't try stopping global warming, but I do think that some of the results that have been shown from the polar living fish species are because of we've do, done crappy research. They have a capacity to acclimate, and they have probably a capacity to adapt also if given time. We should try to slow it down or even stop the global warming, of course. But I don't think we will see any major disaster on the fish population due to this, maybe more from overfishing. Thank you.